Hello, Sandy. Hello, Bill. It's, it's, it, I'm really in charge tonight yet again. You know, usually when you let me run the show, you're, you're frustrated and, and, and annoyed by me most of the time, or you seem like you're that way. You, you, you sure you're up for this ride? What's your point, Bill? <laughs> All right, Sandy, who are we talking about today? Cezanne. Cezanne. <laughs> uh, I am a fan of this card Cezanne. player series. I am a fan of Cezanne. Ah, I see what you did there. That's cute. <laughs> um, I, I, I am a big fan of this card player series. And at some point in my life, I think I've seen three of them. I still have one to collect. Actually, no, I probably have seen four. I actually, I don't know that I've seen the one in London. Um, I've seen the one in Musée d'Orsay and I've seen the Met and I've seen the Barnes last week. Um, and uh, what, what I thought this would be fun to discuss though is the way that he basically worked one idea five different times. Um, trying to come to some sort of, I guess, conclusion or reduction or simplification or distillation of the idea that he was trying to create in the first place. And I, I like that idea that it's like this iterative process because it's very rare. Most art is an iterative process, but you usually don't see it quite this obvious, you know? Um, so I thought it would be, I thought it'd be fun to talk about. Are you, are you game for that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're like, the show. I, I am. All right. Now, how old was, who are we talking about today? Cezanne. <laughs> uh, Cezanne was uh, 50 something, early 50s when he made these. He was like later in his life. Uh, well, uh, paintings are all considered to come from his later period. So that is yeah the last 16 years of his life really yeah yeah um uh, they were made over a span of time the paintings we're going to look at that it was relatively short like really a five-year span for five paintings but nobody's yep. quite sure where in that span they were painted which is kind of unusual um and we'll see more about that in a minute but we, i mean we yep. are talking about the card players um this selection are the 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 studies that he made um, a farmer, or, local farmers is what I've read. Yeah, so, I mean, Suzanne came from a very kind of wealthy and affluent background, and yep. his family state had lots of people who worked there, and probably these models were just farmhands, people who worked on the land that his father owned, um, or indeed would have uh, frequented the little bar in, <laughs> in the village. Don't you love the idea that, 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 you know, his people were there, they're like, listen, you can either work the land today or you could stand here and let me paint you for three hours. Like it's up to you. It's a, it's a special life. And I think it was around this time. I think I remember reading that his father passed away was around this time. So he inherited a lot of stuff too. Um, I mean, he's had quite a complicated relationship with his dad. Yeah. I'm sure I don't know if you know this or if people watching know this but uh, you know as I said he came from a wealthy background his dad was a banker and um, he had a kind of allowance that his dad gave him which meant that wouldn't that be nice yeah he was kind of liberated from the sure. financial difficulties uh, that a lot of other artists would have been feeling or do you know as a, as a par parenthetical aside on that subject have you found any sort of correlation between the sort of poor artists versus rich artists and their work? Well, we've ever noticed about any a long time ago, actually, Richard, yeah. didn't we? Yeah, we did. But that I mean, we did it on a sort of like not global scale. Like, do you? I mean, if you really look across all the artists you study, do you do you notice any commonalities? Um. Well, funnily enough, not really from France <laughs> in this period, because they were very much part of a, a movement that lasted a span of, let's say, 50 years, um, through which they all converged. So whether they were rich or poor, I mean, in their 
proper private lives, we could say that, well, Suzanne didn't have to worry in the same way that a young Picasso might have, or certainly, um, I mean, even Van Gogh, when we talked about yeah. him, you know, we're talking about, you know, a shoeless hobo, pretty much, with Van Gogh, um, because of the way he chose to live his, his life. Mm, but, you know, Suzanne, like many others, had an interwoven relationship with other painters, other artists who were working in a similar time period. I mean, he met Monet. He was influenced by Pizarro and Courbet. Um, and he knew Zola really well. So he, he was somebody who was well connected, but that wasn't unusual for artists who were successful at that time. So yep. whether rich or poor, it didn't necessarily change their currency as artists, which I find fascinating. Yeah, yeah, like the, the, the quality of their work was the real measure of the person at the time. Mm. Um, which is, or at least I don't know, maybe, it, maybe it was or maybe it wasn't, but that's the way it feels like today, you know, when we look at it from, from the past. I mean, there's even those stories of all the, the abstract expressionists all, you know, hanging out together at the bar and drinking and being friends. It's like, yeah. maybe they were, maybe they weren't, or, you know, maybe that's all a bunch of BS that we've mythologized over time. No, I mean, I um, think definitely are. Well, we know that there are specific movements, but also within that, there are social scenes. Sure. And uh, I mean, Cezanne, maybe in some ways, was a little separate from that. He divided his time between Provence and Paris, especially a bit later on. Um, he, yeah, he, he would return to, he would return to a, a very comfortable life. And when his dad passed away, his inter inheritance was substantial. Yeah. Um, and actually, I, again, I don't know if you know this already, but he had a long-term mistress who he didn't want to tell his father about because he feared his father would stop his allowance. Oh, I don't think I knew about that. Okay. And Suzanne and his mistress had a, had a child and they lived as a, a family, you know, they were a functioning family. And uh, he would, would often leave her in Provence and travel backwards and forwards to Paris. And his dad did find out about her eventually and threatened to cut him off, which is what Suzanne had feared. And then eventually they reconciled and his father actually gave him money for the, the little boy for the family. So there was, that's what, I mean, he had a very complicated with, uh, relationship with his dad because he was aware his dad controlled really his financial, uh, his financial life. Sure. And he wanted that money. He needed that money to live as he wanted. Um, but at the same time, I think he realized his father was a traditionalist. He was very old fashioned. Um, but I mean, even Suzanne later in his life, who was a devout Catholic, really devout Catholic. I don't know whether he was at odds with himself really about not having married the mistress. He's also, uh, uh, the pictures of him, he looks like a very intense kind of guy. Mm. I wonder if he actually was, or if it's just, there's something about, he has a slightly like Rasputin-esque kind of look to him in the few pictures that I've Only seen. Only enough, yeah. I've often thought he looks a bit like <laughs> <laughs> It's not just me, right? Well, it's not just you. That's very strange, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I mean, he is he's, uh, the father of post-impressionism. Both Matisse and Picasso credited him with being the father of us all, is their famous quote. So Cezanne is the father of us all. Apparently, they both said that. Um, and that's because Cezanne bridges the gap between impressionism and cubism. So Yeah, it is really interesting the direction he ends up going in. Mm. Uh, as time goes on yeah it's I mean and even even in the early painting which is very it's interesting because it's very representational it's very sort of straightforward it's the big one that's at Barnes right it was the first one I think um, is has a lot going on right you mean the pipes on the wall the frame on the wall the jar up in the corner the the little boy watching them playing has always felt added on after the fact to me. That always feels like it shouldn't be there to me. Hmm. Um, there's just, it, it's, it's like, it's like one step too much, you know? Um, 
It's also interesting to me, and as you as it goes on and these things become simpler, the title of this painting wasn't the card game. No, it's, but I think you know it's quite right when we look at it being the card players. He had a vested interest in these human figures. Yeah. Um, and actually, there's loads of evidence. I mean, he did X-ray studies on. I don't know if it was this one or the one after, which would be this one. Yep. Um, and they discovered that he had lots of underdrawing, and that the the human characters had caused him so many problems in terms of refining his final painting. And yep. there was a lot of um, evidence, therefore, to suggest that actually these studies that he had made, knowing he wanted to tackle. Uh, a kind of bar scene um, that though he was able to capture the essence, as he might have felt of these people, of these individuals, he then found it very difficult to put them into the scene, into the space. To meld them together into an actual single image, yeah. Hmm. Yep, yeah. I mean, I mean there's it's a lot of things about this also that links us back to um, classical painting. It reminds me very much of Supper Emmaus, um, the, the Caravaggio, especially. Yeah, the, the calling St. Matthew, sure. Um, you know, it, it's a very traditional setting. Yeah, yeah. And even even the way it's done, although it's interesting because while there is a lot of information in there, there's a lot of detail in each of these characters. It's it's not like it's not going for realism per se. It's not going for sort of a there's still definitely like an impressionistic thing about the feel of the whole thing. Um, and especially there's something about the guy on the right with the blue coat on. Mm. Um, feels particularly, uh, how do I put this? Cartoon-esque to me. Like it feels like something somebody would draw in a children's book 70 years later, you know? Uh, and that's not a rip on it. It's just, you know, I just looking at it with modern eyes, you can kind of see where that look is going you know, generations later. That's maybe in some ways uh, slight folly to look at it in that way, because of course we look at it with hindsight. Sure, yeah. Right? But at the time, maybe people would not have registered that cartoon-like quality at all. They, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but, it, but I mean, look at like the, like the, 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 you know, the blue of the jacket and the, you know, the orange yellow of the curtain behind him. It's just all of these things, like it's, it's all very, it is well thought out, but it does feel cluttered to me. But but interestingly enough, when you see this in person, because it is a big painting, how long? How big did we say that this was? Uh, it's at one uh, let's see. Yeah, this this one is is yeah, 130 by 180 centimeters. So, you know, 53 by 71 inches. Um, this is a pretty big canvas. Um, not big in a, you know, classical painting point of view, but but pretty big for him. And it's, it is interesting when you see it in person. Um, I don't know if this representation, this, this particular photograph of it, I think is not a great, it's, it feels brighter than it is in real life. Um, on, on this one. Yeah, it's interesting, because the one in the Met actually feels like the, you know, the next one over, that's kind of what it looks like on the wall, you know, mm -hmm. when, when you go see it. Um, but it's very obvious that when he went to the one that's at the Met now, which I think wasn't that long after, um, you know, you could see the things that he decided were superfluous, yeah. you know, that he was that that he was he was thinking to himself, all right, I, I packed everything in there. But there's something about this story that feels like I'm just uh, um, um, like overdosing the viewer in some ways. And interestingly enough, one of the things he removed is the kid who always felt odd to me in that original picture. Um, uh, um, in terms of, I mean, you're looking at this, I suppose, in perhaps a more technical way than I would. Sure, say. that's so fair. When I see them as the series, because I mean, ultimately I'm, I am just going to go, if we start where we were, we've got the studies. Yep. Yep. Um, that again, we're not quite sure the, the dates on these. Not you and I. I mean, nobody yeah. really has particular purchase on the exact. But they, but they weren't made ten years before the painting, the no, big painting. So right? yeah. It was not made very rapidly. Then yep. we have, I think, this, and I've put these slides in order of the way I suppose they would have been painted. Then we from, have. The from what I've read, you have these two, and then the other three are questionable. What order they came in? Yes. So, but but we know that the 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 two 
um, larger scenes or, or the ones that have more characters were painted, we think, earlier. And then yes. we have these ones. I love that one. This one. Yeah, that one makes me happy. That and interestingly enough, that's the one that's in that's supposedly owned by the daughter of the Amir of Qatar or whatever. Yes, um, but the Qatari royal family paid something like 250 million. Million, yeah. So it was one of the most expensive paintings in history. Apparently, the story I heard was that his whole the Amir like or whatever the leader is basically his daughter runs the museum and gave her a billion dollars a year to spend on art <laughs> to to build up the museum and that was one of the things she bought was was that that version sorry i cut you off go ahead no i would have said the same uh interestingly enough too i was reading a a book let me see if i can pull up the actual quote i was at the library the other day and i happened to be in the art section i was sitting writing my script and i had to take a break and I look up and I noticed that European painting was the section I was sitting in. So I was like, hey, you know, I've read everything I could find online about these paintings. I want to see what they say in one of these big Cezanne, you know, books. And I picked up this book by uh, Maria Teresa Benedetti. Do you know this person? I don't know enough about, you know, a lot of these art historians. Um, I found it. I found it interesting because the way that she talks about uh, the, the 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 paintings is just really interesting. Um, is that let me let me find the quote I liked here. Um, but Cezanne uh, was not at all interested in portraiture here, and although the figures certainly have character, and one is tempted to attribute personalities to them, it is clear that they were chosen to convey more universal, formal, and expressive aims. Mm -hmm. The lack of depth the few elements in the background and the irregular perspective of the table highlight the players wrapped in clothes with rigid voluminous folds, accentuating the players large rounded shoulders and ungainly hands and unusually uh, la, 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 malig uh, maliquent, maliguent, I'd never heard that word, uh, manner. If the standing figure is less spatial and seem to be absorbed by the wall, the others including the child with the lovely uh, uh, um, oval face are weighty and solid. It's just, it's interesting the way people look at paintings, trying to put into words. I don't, I mean, yes, I see what I see what she's saying, but I would never, those are not the things that I would pull out of these paintings if I were going to write about them. You know what I mean? Was that not the point of us looking at painting though? Ab ab absolutely. One of the points that they, that she brought up though, which I hadn't really thought about I never, the, the, the perspective of the table, for example, never bothered me because the perspective of all of this paintings are so loose anyway. They're not, these are not drawn on a grid. You know what I mean? These are not drawn with perspective lines and horizons across the middle of it. No, um, let's, let's pay some respect to how maverick <laughs> this was. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm entirely saying, I'm just saying that's not what he was going for. That's not what he was trying to do. So it's interesting to make a point of that it just seems like you're highlighting something that was like, oh, that he was uh, missed, missed the board when he wasn't aiming for that at all is what I'm saying. Um, I'm just- Hang on there, no. Go ahead. So, Cezanne was actually looking for refinement. Uh, the geometry of refinement or the refinement of geometry doesn't matter which way around you look at it. And that's why he is, of course, known as the forefather, not the father, but the forefather of, for example, and particularly cubism. Right? Yeah, yeah but I'm, I'm talking about, um, I'm not talking about geometry as a, um, a uh, 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 visual pursuit. I'm talking about uh, perfection in angles and that kind of stuff. I, that's not what he was looking to, to, to. I don't think that that was his gain. That wasn't his aim. You know what I mean? That wasn't his goal. His goal was not to create photo perfect versions of people in front of him. 
he was creating a scene out of his mind's eye using sketches of people around him. You see what I'm saying? Like that in some ways, th th these are very much an interpretation of a scene, not a reproduction of a scene to me. Go ahead, do you disagree? Mm. I don't think I disagree completely, but what I want to think about is that if Suzanne is returning to the same subject matter time and time again, that yeah. tells me, even if I knew nothing at all, that he has a particular invested interest in whatever the thing is. Now, it would be easy for somebody who doesn't know anything to say, well, he has a particular interest in card players. Right. Yeah. That, I, no. That. Yeah. That's not what it is. I don't think. No. But then we could peel the onion a little bit, and we could say, well, he has a vested interest in um, in light and shadow, the operation of light and shadow within a space. We could say that. We could yeah. also say that he has a particular interest in moving a palette away from something that is loaded with a kind of uh, realism, which would have been mm -hmm. part of reaction to impressionism. Uh, and we could then also say that he has a particular focus on the geometry or geometries of the objects within the space. And that actually even the human characters are in themselves ge geometric studies. Okay. Right, so we could see that we have planes of space that are starting to be flattened out, played with, looked at in a way that, you know, again, at this time in art history, in Western painting, you know, where does this come from? Well, I, interestingly enough, if we go back to one, uh, the, 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 the first one, the bluer one. Yeah. Okay. I look at this and to me, if I, I'm looking at if I see this out of the corner of my eye, it mm. feels like an out of focus photograph to me. So I think that I think that he knew the way the people and the space and the bottle and the table, all of that is where he wants it to be. But then it's about like just removing extraneous detail that he doesn't need so that there is there is a flattened form to it absolutely but i also feel like if you if you look at this one compared to the earlier ones where the earlier ones feel like a um like he's painting a scene these feel like he's painting there's something that happens when you take a picture and it takes a three-dimensional space and it just flattens it right I mean, don't forget, he had a really particular interest in binocular vision and kind of sure. phenomena. He was really interested yeah. in, 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 op in optics. In yeah. And so it, it very well could be that, you know, this he was seeing this almost in a photographic perspective. But what, what's interesting to me is, is, is he, he realized that he didn't need to tell the story he, first of all, he didn't need anything more than two players, right? Which is kind of interesting that he came down to, mm. you know, the two initial ones with five people, four people. And he's like, no, it's called the card players. And you really only need two people to play cards. Um, and the three are, are structurally very similar. The back, they were obviously based upon the same background. They all have the bottle on the table. They all have, you know, the two guys in very similar clothes uh, doing it. I look at all three of those and I, I know the, the order that you've put them in. It's interesting to me to try to figure out what order he made them in because they are, I, it's hard for me to tell exactly which direction they're going. You know what I mean? Within those mm -hmm. three. Because they are very different from each other. I can see that there is, I mean, this is assumption. Uh, you know, yep. I don't know. But, Give me assumption. But, right, we know that that was the first one. Yes. Right, so that's that's established. Yep. And then we have this one, and we think that this one, you know, the other one was the first one, so this is after, right? Yeah, and it's that's smaller. It's a reduction of everything we talked about, so it makes sense. Yes, go ahead. 
that's enough information for us to then say or suppose that there is actually a very strong visual relationship between this one and this one. How do you figure? Um, I think it's to do with um, either the underdrawing or the underpainting. And it's got to do with a particular quality of tonality in the paint. So when I look at the... Um, oh, okay, I can see that, yeah. Folds of fabric, especially, and how that has been molded into a three-dimensional sense, yeah, through the yeah. application of dark tones. It has the same quality as this one. So um, we know that he was uh, influenced by Courbet, as I mentioned already. Yep. And he would have been working oftentimes with a palette knife, quite large brush strokes. And you can almost see that in some, especially in the jackets, the color blending in the jackets. But actually that was amazing. That wasn't the standard way of painting, actually. He did work with quite small brush strokes and it allowed him eventually to work back into paint surfaces and um, to get a, a, almost like a richness. Now, in many ways, if we look at the jacket on um, the character, the, the dark brown jacket, and we yep. look here between the two of them, yep. the qualities of the paint. Now we've got one where we've got um, lilac and we've got one where we've got green and the application of those colors i don't know if you can see this or if people yeah, I'm, I'm looking at a higher res version as you flip through them go ahead okay um if we look at the actual marks that are made like which one has this i know this sounds silly but which one has the smaller marks because i wonder if over time you know his he he kind of goes from grand to small to, to grand again so We've got something that's busy, full, and I would say almost kind of small, although it's a big yep. painting. Yep. Then we get to something which fills, the paint fills more. It yep. feels fuller, even though there's less. So the reduction happens in a different way. This is paired away and the brush strokes are big. Then we can see again, evidence of relatively large strokes and then on this one we may be looking at smaller still again so it's a, a, a contraction and expansion mm. I, okay can i give a can i give an alternate theory yeah i think the i think the last three could be in is that the last one you have is that the the fifth of your slides yeah okay I, you could also argue that it goes the other direction if only because in in the 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 last two of your slides, I feel like the 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 um, relative sizes of certain things, like the the uh, for example, the guy the guy on the left, I feel like his head is too small in this one. Yeah. Go back one, I think his head is too small in the last one, and then you go to the last one or the third one in your in your stack, and the perspective is is is. Uh, yeah, I mean, go to the, the, the two back to the perspective on this one is correct, right? Like this one, this one feels more real than mm -hmm. the other two. Um, that's I see what you parity between this one and this one. Uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but at the same time, I feel like there is a, um, I, I still feel like the first two paintings feel more, and I don't mean this in the derogatory way, but like more cartoonish than the the later ones do. Like I feel like the especially the, the the this one. I don't know this, and this is this is just a hunch. This is just me and my brain. As somebody, this is I maybe I watched too much of that Beatles documentary. This feels. Oh, you've been dying to shoehorn that in some. Way. Sorry. This font, this one, or your last one, feel the most refined to me. If that makes sense, like it feels like he landed somewhere. Where with this one? Yes, for me, I feel like he landed on this one. I think the one in London feels like the weakest of the three. Yeah, 
just because I, I feel like the, pers- the, like the general perspective of the whole thing is off. I feel like the background isn't quite as uh, uh, like elegantly done as it is in the other two. Oh, hang on, let's look at the expectations of what we value in this painting. Yep. You know, we are, I said to you earlier, let's be very careful that we don't apply with hindsight what wouldn't have been known then. And and at the same time, you know, we are also applying the conditions of our understanding of what makes a good painting to this and obviously in context of the wider series. Now, of course, yeah. There's no reason to say why actually this isn't in many ways a superior painting to the others. For example, I'm not saying it is, but for example, because actually the intention of what was happening or what he was doing mm, might be met more readily in this painting than in the others because of there being a distortion to the perspective, because of there being a sense of um, sure. liberal application of paint in a way that you know the Impressionists had tackled, but that hadn't been coupled with again this idea of geometry the the geometry of space this one this one feels that one feels unfinished to me it feels like he went down a road and then he was playing with the background and he was playing with the jackets and he wasn't quite sold on it and then he 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 wanted to start over again that's what it feels like to me and this is i mean again this is just yes this is me putting a 2021 interpretation on something i'm just going from again it's a hunch um I look at I look at the jacket in the one that I like, especially the blue jacket on the left, the guy, and I just see the colors going on in that one and like the roughness of it all, and it it feels like textured in a three dimensional way. It just it feels like it's um. It feels like he cared about it. Does that make sense? Hmm. I mean, we could listen. There's no right answer to any of this. This is no. this is. This is kind of why I wanted to talk about these, just because. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you have Do you have a favorite of these last three? This one. Yeah. Okay. So we we agree that our favorite is the same one. Yeah, but we might not have the same reasons for it being our favorite. Well, that's fine. I don't think you and I would ever have the same reasons for anything being our favorite. <laughs> But I think, um, um, you know, this is not the one that's shown as a standalone painting. This is the one that is shown as a standalone painting. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the one, uh, Dorsey, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that maybe you and I should, we should make a heist movie where we go and steal the one we like from uh, the Museum of Qatar. Stolen. You know that. Oh, that one was? That's the one? Um, so, well, I don't know if it was this one actually. Uh, there was an exhibition in the '60s and it was stolen. It was, I mean, it was recovered eventually, but um, it was, sort of went missing. It's interesting with art. I always find that you know the reemergence of art that has been stolen does tend to elevate it further. Does it? Well, that's that's the Mona Lisa. That's uh... Well, none of the stuff that was stolen from uh, Boston. But even, you know, for painting to have its own life. Yeah. In the, in the way that we talked about Cathedral before by Newman, Barnett Newman. Sure. Yep. And it had been slashed and stabbed and it gave it a different kind of quality. Well, I think pe- people, like, people like those stories, right? Normal mm. people like the stories, you know the red yellow and blue is the same way right like i'm gonna say something really controversial now but actually Suzanne does nothing for me and never interesting and i respect Suzanne, and obviously i understand the the place he takes in western art history i appreciate and can see of course i can see that what he was doing is of course the precursor to what Picasso would then pick up. Yep. Um, so I understand the significance of it, but I just genuinely, which is most unusual for me, can't quite ever get the place that other people get with his work in, in the genuine appreciation and admiration of it. 
No, I mean, I, I mean, I disagree with you, but I understand that there are artists whose work does nothing for me that other people seem to love. Um, uh, yeah, it, it is a... I don't think I've ever admitted that before to anyone because it seems like the worst thing that anyone involved in art would say is that, oh, I'm not that interested in Cezanne. But uh, I'm not. I tell you one of the most interesting things about Cezanne is actually by way of Picasso. Uh, so Picasso, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but I was very fortunate to go on the very last tour on the very last day of his chateau at Vavanagh being open to the public. It's very That's limited amazing. numbers. And there was one ticket left and I tried to get tickets before arriving in Provence and I had been hampered by poor French uh, and hadn't been able to purchase them. And so rocked up on the day, I knew it was hit and miss and there was one ticket left, I got it. I got on this minibus, it was guided tour only. It was very small numbers. There were only, I think 12 of us allowed in at one time. And they were basically waiting to shut up the chateau and to throw away the key. Uh, and when we drove up through the windy road, um, suddenly a mountain revealed itself and it was Mont Saint Victoire, which is famous from Cézanne's painting. And one of the reasons apparently why Picasso bought his chateau where it was is because he could look upon the mountain that beloved Cézanne had painted so often. And that's how significant Cézanne was to Picasso. Picasso understood the debt of gratitude to Cézanne and what Cézanne had done. Plus it was a pretty place to live. I mean, yeah, fabulous place to live. But the fact, I mean, it's looking at the mountain from the other side, but sure. nonetheless, I could sort of imagine Picasso in moments of um, intense reverie, looking upon this mountain and, and finding something of Cezanne and understanding its significance. It is interesting though, is, is, it a, is it an emotional thing or an intellectual thing that makes you not, is it, do you, under, you understand it's important? Do you understand the skill this guy had? It just doesn't do anything for you or you just, you just don't get it at all? Like I, I can't stand Chagall and everyone loves Chagall. And I look at Chagall and I'm like, this is nonsense. This is like some terrible childhood dreamscape that I would want to get out of, not go into. Um, so maybe I feel the same way about Chagall. You feel feel about Cezanne? I, that's I, is, is, is it is it is it is it is it a? Um, have you always felt that way? I guess is my question. Yeah. 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 I think there's something about his work that I like, you know, in the, in the same way that, you know, the stuff that I like of Sargent's where mm -hmm. there's elements of it, where he just paints little tiny swipes with a knife, but in context, it totally works because mm -hmm. the stuff that has detail is the stuff that needs detail and the stuff that doesn't, your eyes aren't looking there anyway. So it, it almost makes it better because out of your focus plane, it actually all blends really well if it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Cezanne does some of that in a way that pleases my eye, um, especially with that last, uh, the last set of two, those two people sitting there. I, I, it's like, I can, I can feel the texture of the painting and I can feel the amount of information he put in was no more and no less than he absolutely needed to. And so there's like this efficiency in it mm. that is very, it's like, it's, it's like triple distilled. You know what I mean? It's just, it's exactly what it needs and no more um, to get the point across. Yeah. And so really in response to your earlier question, I know all of that. Really, I do, and I appreciate it, and I respect it. But nonetheless, the resonance of it doesn't, it's not there. I don't feel that's, it. That's fair. Uh, if, 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 
you suddenly came into half a million dollars and you had to buy one of these, would it be that last one? Yeah. Only because I might, if I was a bit drunk and bleary eyed, I might be able to kid myself <laughs> on. I might be able to kid myself on that, you know, there's a connection even with Hopper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see that. I like that. Yeah. No, I, that's, that is a, a perspective I hadn't thought of. Nice job. Yeah. Isn't it funny? There's actually something surprisingly modern about this painting to me. I don't think that's surprising. I mean, modern in the sense that like you could see those guys doing the same exact thing 50 years later and they'd be the same guys with slightly different coats on. Like I could, there's a lot of paintings that I look at that I can't imagine you know, I look at Renoir paintings or whatever it is, and I'll, I'm just like, I can't imagine these people in today's world. Like, I can't imagine them being real. Mm. These two guys, I can imagine just these two guys sitting playing cards of any generation. You could slide back two generations to the beginning of the 19th century. You could slide two generations forward to 1950, and it would still be the same two guys sitting and playing cards, especially in France, because, you know, I just think I just think this one's neat. And I think that the process by which he seems to have gone to get there. It feels like he gave five attempts and in the fifth one, in my opinion, this one, he got to where he wanted to go and then he could move on, but he couldn't move on until he got it where he wanted to go. Recently, I was looking at a picture I took and I was just like, I need to redo this because I can do this better. And it's gonna nag at me until I actually do it. You ever feel that way? No. Again, another difference between you and I. Only because I, I of course understand the value of practice. Sure. Right? But yep. I also maybe just let go of things. Yeah, yeah. No, I definitely become, <sighs> you know, I, I wrote down two to finish up here, I wrote down two quotes from the Beatles documentary, which really got to me. You ready? Mm -hmm. Here's something Paul McCartney said. To wander aimlessly is very unswinging. <laughs> I just thought that was great. And then they were, they, they were deciding whether or not they were going to put out uh, Get Back as a single. And George Martin said, never save a good idea. Do it. And I love the idea that, you know, there's so many people who are just like, oh, I have an idea of making a painting about these card players. And it's like, Okay, just do it. Well, I don't know if I have it figured out yet. I don't care if you have figured out yet. Just do it and then move on to the next one. There will always be another idea. Hmm. I like the fact that he waited and got it right, in my opinion. Look at that jacket. Look at the shoulder and the lower back of the guy on the left. Those blotches of color are just like amazing. Anyway, thank you for, uh, you know, pandering to me and letting me talk about Cezanne, even though apparently you really can't stand. I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> no, but you're not a fan, but it's okay. I appreciate it. No, but hang on. I, again, this is very important to make clear. You know, you and I are accountable for our opinions at sure. the same time. The value of what we do is in the looking together. Yeah, absolutely. So actually what I conclude with as an opinion is nonsense. I'm, I'm not shutting this down in a conclusion of Sandy Robertson doesn't like Suzanne. What a ridiculous thing. I didn't mean to apply that. I just, I just think that it's, I think it's uh, very nice of you to allow me to talk about this for, you know, an hour. Wow. Look how white that look how white that pipe is. I love the book. I would I would never have the guts to make that pipe that white. The least Cezanne-ish part of the whole painting is the bottle, and that's the bit I like the most. It's interesting. And one of the ones right before it, the bottle is much less distinct. Mm. It's it's very much in the background of the of the one that I say is unfinished. Um yeah, it's interesting. 
Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, Bill.